парде на сите што не очекувавме толку голем број на студенти денеска малку повеќе очекувавме и тоа супер е што се собравме тука today we are, we are happy to welcome a giant personality at our university dr ken brentley from the doctor from the united states of america i am quite sure that many of you know the story or part of the story about him just to give a short introduction in 2014 it has been a major outbreak of Ebola virus in West Africa in four countries Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea and, and, uh, and Nigeria so immediately after that outbreak Dr. Kent Brentley together with the uh, people of his uh, organization Samaritanian Spurs went there and started helping the people affected of the virus so they were aware about the dangers and about the threats of that virus, but they didn't save themselves. Uh, unfortunately, seven weeks after being there, Dr. Kent contracted the virus by itself, and afterwards, the entire st story began. So he has been treated uh, after two weeks by some drug which was in phase of development. The belief in God actually was also part of his story. I'm quite sure that he will tell us some life story that will be inspiration for, for many generations to come. Before I give a word to Dr. Kent, I just want to thank to two people here, to Dr. Andy for his efforts to, to uh, give us contacts and, and brings, uh, who, who brings uh, doctors here to, that uh, make workshops with, with our students, also giving lectures, helping our students to, to find their way in the future, and also to Strahil, where is Strahil, who is organizer of all these events. So at the end you're gonna see, and you can, can set up questions to Dr. Kent and to Dr. Andy too, but you're gonna see that Dr. Kent is just a simple man who wants to help the people. Dr. Kent, it's your turn, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dean. And thank you to all of you for this great opportunity to, to speak to you today. Thank you for welcoming us to Macedonia. I'm accompanied by my cousin, Dr. Stephen Snell, who also spent two years working in East Africa in the country of Zambia. And we traveled together to come visit your country and we thank you for the warm welcome we have received here. I was invited to speak to the medical faculty, to the students, and I could give you a, an academic talk about viral hemorrhagic fevers, about Ebola. But instead, today I want to share a story with you. Because I think there are some things very important about being a physician that are not academic. They are, they are beyond academics and they, they speak to the heart of what it means to be a physician. So I want to share with my, my story with you today it's a story of medicine. It's also a story of illness. It's a story of limited resources. It is a story of, of faith and miracles. It's a story of devastation and suffering for a people who have known more than their fair share of devastation and suffering in the past three decades. So like most of you, I chose a career in medicine because I wanted to serve people. My motivation came from my religious faith and the teaching to love your neighbor as yourself. I would never dare to compare myself to Mother Teresa, but I very much identify with her calling to serve the poor. So from the beginning of my journey, on the long road of medical education, and you know that it's a very long road, I wanted to use my skills as a doctor to serve people in, in what I call the majority world, the, the social setting in which the majority of the world's population lives. And from the beginning, that was my calling, to use my profession of medicine in service to God by serving the poor 
by serving people in need. And so I had to nurture that calling along the way. And at every opportunity along the long road of medical education, I, I took advantage of every opportunity to participate in, in that kind of work and serving people in need. So in medical school, I helped serve in, in clinics for our indigent population, for the homeless people in the city where I was living and working, and for people who did not have other access to medical care. And I spent the summer between my first and second years of medical school working with a Christian service organization in the country of Honduras to gain some international experience in serving people in need. I'm a family physician. My specialty is family medicine or family practice. And even my choice of that specialty was, was guided by my desire and my calling to serve those in need because in family medicine, I knew I would not be limited by a patient's demographics or by the disease from which they were suffering because family physicians take care of all people regardless of their age or gender or what disease they have. So one of the other things I did to maintain my focus was to attend conferences and surround myself with peers who would encourage my faith as well as my interest in global health. It was at one of those conferences that I attended that I, I met the people from Samaritan's Purse. The dean mentioned Samaritan's Purse, the organization I was working for in Liberia. I met those people at a conference about global health. And they had a program called the Post-Residency Program. And I learned that when I finished my training, I could join their program. And, and for two years, at, at the beginning of my career, I could have a mentor to help guide my transition from physician in America to physician in Liberia. <coughs> and it was at one of those conferences also that I met another doctor named Dr. Rick Sacra. And, and if you were following the news on CNN or any American news outlet, you might recognize his name because while I was the first patient to be treated in America for Ebola virus disease, my friend Dr. Rick was the third patient to be treated for Ebola in America. So I met Dr. Rick at a conference and he was from another part of the United States, but he had been working in Liberia for more than 15 years. He had been working at a hospital in Liberia taking care of patients there. And he had a vision and a dream for starting a family practice residency program at that hospital for Liberian doctors to give them advanced training in family medicine in order to help build up the healthcare infrastructure of that country. <laughs> And Dr. Rick and I connected on very many levels in sharing a common faith and a common vision of, of serving the poor and serving people in need. And so less than one year after meeting Dr. Rick at a conference, my wife and I signed up to the program with Samaritan's Purse and with our two young children, my daughter was four years old and my son was two years old, my, our family moved to Liberia in West Africa and we settled into our home on the beach there. We lived 30 yards, maybe 30 meters from the Atlantic Ocean. And after a few days of settling into our new life, I started working at Elwa Hospital with Dr. Rick. Elwa is E-L-W-A. Those were the call letters of a radio station in the 1950s that started in that same place on the coast of Liberia and it's the name of the hospital. It, the hospital there is not a big hospital, maybe 50 beds. And we had a large team of doctors. We had four American doctors. Three of us were family physicians and we had one general surgeon. But then we also had several Liberian physicians on our team, general practitioners. We even had one general practitioner from the Democratic Republic of Congo who had come from Central Africa to West Africa to serve people in need there. And the medical director of our hospital was a man named Dr. Jerry Brown. Dr. Jerry was a Liberian by nationality, 
He was a general surgeon by training, and he was the medical director of our hospital. And that may sound like a very large team of doctors for such a small facility, but I assure you that the need there was so great that we stayed very busy, and we did our best to offer compassionate medical care to our patients. I want to tell you about my very first patient in Liberia. On my second day in the hospital, Dr. Rick said to me, I heard there's a sick boy in the emergency room. I want you to go take care of him for the day. He said, don't worry about rounding on the inpatient ward. Don't worry about the outpatient clinic. You just focus on this one patient. It was my first day in a new, in a new place. And so I went to the emergency room and I found a young 12-year-old boy. We'll call him Michael. That's not his real name, but for his privacy, I'll call him Michael. Michael had type 1 diabetes, juvenile diabetes. And he had run out of his insulin several days before. But he did not tell his family until he began to feel sick. So when Michael came to our emergency room, he had been vomiting for a number of days. He was very sick, very dehydrated. We checked his blood sugar, and it was very, very high, above the upper limits of the machine we were using. So I diagnosed Michael with diabetic ketoacidosis. It's a very uh, serious, dangerous problem for people with type 1 diabetes. When they run out of insulin, and their blood sugar goes very high, and they develop acidosis. So I began treating Michael like I had learned in my, in my training in America with aggressive IV in, intravenous fluid resuscitation and intravenous insulin. But I learned very quickly that treating this patient with diabetic ketoacidosis was going to be very different from the many cases of diabetic ketoacidosis I had treated back in America. For one, there was not the, the equipment I was used to. Back in America, I would tell the nurse, I want you to run his fluid at 150 milliliters per hour. And she would push the buttons on an electronic pump and it would go. But in Liberia, we didn't have that pump. Maybe you don't have that here, I don't know. But I had to learn on my first day on the job how to count the number of drips per minute in the drip chamber to calculate the fluid rate and not just the fluid, but also the IV insulin, which is a critical medication that if you give it too fast, it can kill a patient. And if you give it too slowly, he may die from his disease process. But then I learned what would be the most difficult difference in treating this young boy. You see, I had learned in medical school how to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. I had learned that the most important number was not the blood sugar but it was a number called the anion gap, a calculation using three different lab values, the sodium, the chloride, and the carbon dioxide. What I learned that first day on the job is that our laboratory could not give me that information. We could not run his carbon dioxide level. I could not find out his, his pH. And I would not have the information I needed to calculate his anion gap. So I would not have the information I had always used to treat this deadly disease. I like to, I like to compare it to make an analogy of a, an airplane pilot who's flying in a storm, cannot see the ground, and the, in, the instruments stop working. And he doesn't know how high he is or how fast he's flying. And that's how I felt my first day on the job. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending. This was not a story about how I became the hero and saved the day. You see, after two or three days of treating Michael and praying that God would spare his life, after two or three days, Michael breathed his last breath, and he left this life for the next life. My very first patient in Liberia was a 12-year-old boy who died of a disease I thought I was fully capable of treating. 
And so began my life in Liberia. Liberia is a country that has suffered through nearly 20 years of civil war and conflict. And in Liberia, death is a very present and real part of life. It stakes its claim on the young and the old alike. And it destroys hope for everyone around it. But I had moved to Liberia not simply to save lives. No, I had moved to Liberia to replace hopelessness with hope. I was motivated by the virtue taught by Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. And although there were days in Liberia when I felt very defeated, I knew that death was not the ultimate enemy. I knew that our purpose there was greater than the efficacy of our medications. We were there to have compassion on people in need. We were there, like Mother Teresa, to be the hands of Jesus to a hurting world. And so, when disaster struck the people of Liberia, when the Ebola outbreak started, our, our natural response was not to flee, but to stay and to help and to serve. I first heard about the Ebola outbreak, which started in the country of Guinea. I heard about it while I was at a, a gathering for expatriates living in Monrovia. We were having a meal together. And someone sat down next to me and said, did you hear about the Ebola outbreak in, in Guinea? It spread across the border. It's now in Liberia, in the northern part of Liberia, in the town called Foya. And so, the very next day, the staff of our hospital began preparing immediately for a worst case scenario. We knew that if a patient with Ebola showed up at our hospital, and if we were not prepared, it would cost the lives of our colleagues and our coworkers. You see, Ebola is a, a virus that causes viral hemorrhagic fever. And in previous outbreaks, it has killed up to 90% of its victims. The virus was discovered in 1976, and in all of the recorded outbreaks since that time, healthcare workers had died at a disproportionate rate in these outbreaks because they were the ones on the front lines taking care of sick patients. And so we knew that we had to be prepared. My colleague, Dr. Debbie, who's a general surgeon from the United States, she took the lead for our team. We found a manual on the internet published by the World Health Organization and the American Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It was an online manual with this title, Infection Control for Viral Hemorrhagic Fevers in the African Healthcare Setting. I didn't think we could find anything more appropriate than that. So from the manual, Dr. Debbie created a curriculum for our hospital staff. And we put every member of our hospital staff through a two or three hour hands-on training session. Every member from the doctors and the nurses to the cashiers and the janitors. And while we were training our staff, we also began preparing our facility. We had a small chapel in the courtyard of our hospital where we held daily staff devotional meetings. And we took that small chapel and we converted it into a five bed isolation unit. That was at the end of March of 2014. Two and a half months later, on June 11th, after two and a half months of preparation and practice and training, having never seen a patient with Ebola, but practicing every day our protocols and getting better equipment and setting up our unit in better ways, on June 11th, we received a phone call from the Ministry of Health in Liberia. They said, there's a family in one of the, the slums, one of the poor areas of town in Monrovia that's lost three or four family members in the last week. And we think the cause is Ebola virus disease. And there are two more family members who are sick. And, and they have Ebola. And we're bringing them to your hospital. Because you see, after, after those two and a half months of preparation, <coughs> In the city of Monrovia, a city of more than a million people, our, our little hospital had the only isolation unit for the entire city. And so, Dr. Debbie and I 
volunteered to be the doctors to run the Ebola treatment unit. And our Liberian colleagues continued to run the hospital and the emergency department and the outpatient clinic. And so our days were very quickly consumed with caring for patients with Ebola disease, Ebola virus disease. At first it was just one patient at a time. But after a few days we had two or three or four patients in our small five bed unit. And our days became very long. We would work 16 or 18 or 24 hours at one time. And we would spend three or four hours at a time in the suffocating heat of the personal protective equipment. Those, those suits that look like space suits that you've seen on the internet and on TV. And we did our best to provide supportive care to our patients. Because supportive care is the foundation of treating Ebola virus disease. There is no approved effective direct treatment. There is no there was no vaccine at the time. There is no cure. So supporting patients with intravenous fluids and vitamins and antibiotics and treating them for malaria, that was the foundation of caring for patients with Ebola virus disease. So as we gave the best care possible to our patients and tried to show compassion to them, we watched patient after patient fall prey to this brutal predator of a disease. It caused unrelenting fever, very high fever that would never go away. It caused massive amounts of diarrhea. Patients became very dehydrated. Sometimes it caused hemorrhagic symptoms, bleeding. It would take its victims and strip them of their dignity before killing them. The work in the Ebola treatment unit was very difficult, not only physically, but also emotionally. I remember one patient in particular, I'll call her Lusu, again that's not her real name. She was about 60 years old and I remember sitting on the edge of Lusu's bed in my full personal protective equipment with two pairs of surgical gloves and I held her hand trying to offer her my deepest sympathy because her daughter had just died in the adjacent bed her daughter had just died of Ebola, the same disease that Lusu herself had. They had both contracted Ebola from Lusu's other daughter who was a nurse. Her daughter who was a nurse had been caring for a patient in another hospital. And that patient died and was later diagnosed with Ebola. And then Lusu's daughter developed Ebola. And so Lusu and her other daughter cared for the, the nurse daughter until her death. And then a week later, they both got sick. So Lusu had now lost two daughters to Ebola virus disease, and I sat and held her hand. I even went so far as to sing songs to her to try to lift her spirit and encourage her. And I did that for another two days after her daughter died. And then one morning, I came back from my short night at home to begin my shift in the Ebola treatment unit and I was told by the night shift that Lusu had died during the night. In that first month and a half of treating patients with Ebola, we had 36 patients come into our five bed Ebola treatment unit. We had 16 patients die in our unit. Only one patient who had been diagnosed with Ebola walked out as a survivor. That, that one survivor, his name was Jiba, and that is his name. His, he and his family gave me, gave me permission to tell his story. Jiba was 14 years old, just a boy, and he was never very sick, but he had been in direct contact with a woman who died of Ebola, and then several days later, he developed a fever, and so they tested his blood, and he was positive for Ebola. We treated Jiba for nine days in our Ebola treatment unit. And after nine days, his fever went away, and we tested his blood again, and it was negative for Ebola. And we were able to return him safely to his family. <clears throat> the outbreak that we started engaging with in June continued to increase through June and July. 
And by the end of July, my organization, Samaritan's Purse, had, had voluntarily taken over the Ebola treatment unit in northern Liberia, the town of Foya, that original, original starting place in Liberia for the disease. And they had also uh, agreed with the Ministry of Health to take over the management of all of the Ebola patients in Monrovia. And so we decided the best way to do that was to combine our small Ebola treatment unit at Elwa and the larger Ebola treatment unit at the government hospital called JFK. They were treating some patients there. So we decided we should pool our resources together. And we created a, a new, bigger unit with 20 beds. And I was named the medical director of that new unit. So as the medical director, it was my job to train the staff at our small ETU, as well as the staff at the government hospital, JFK, and to transfer all of our patients from those two units to our new third unit. And it was my job to determine the staffing needs for that new unit and determine how many more people we needed to hire and which positions needed to be filled. And it was a big job for a, for a doctor who was only one year out of his training but it was a very important job that needed to be done. And so we engaged in the fight even more. On Sunday, July 20th, 2014, I woke up before four o'clock in the morning to take my wife and children to the airport. You see, we were all still living together in Liberia, but we had a vacation planned because my wife's brother was getting married in Texas and my children were supposed to be in the wedding. So on July 20th, I took my wife and my children to the airport and I kissed them goodbye. And the plan was that one week later, I would get on an airplane and fly to Texas and join them to celebrate the wedding. I would be home in America for maybe one week. And then I would return to Liberia to continue working in the Ebola treatment unit. So after leaving my wife and children at the airport, I went home, I got a cup of coffee, and I went to work because that day we were going to transfer all of our patients from the two Ebola treatment units into our new third consolidated unit. To give you an idea of how fast the outbreak was increasing, four days earlier, on July 16th, I had taken an inventory of both of those units, of JFK and the one at our hospital, and there were only four patients total that were currently admitted. But after those four days, on the 20th, on the day we were going to transfer everyone, there were 13 patients. And things were beginning to escalate. We transferred all of those patients to our new unit, which we called ELWA 2, number 2. And by the end of the week, that small 20, that, that new larger 20-bed unit became home to more than 30 patients all at one time. But I never got to see Elwa II in that overcrowded state because just three days after we opened our new unit, on Wednesday, July 23rd, I woke up with a fever. I chose to stay home that day thinking that maybe my fever would, would go away, thinking maybe it was just something I ate the night before that was upsetting my stomach but I wouldn't leave my house again until August 1st when I was put on a special airplane to be evacuated back to America. Now, people have asked me, how did you contract Ebola? Was there some, did you make some mistake in the Ebola treatment unit? Did your suit get a tear in it? Did your glove have a hole? What happened? And the honest truth is I will never know what happened. Because there was no mistake, there was no breach of protocol, there was no tear in my suit. I'm convinced still today that the work we did in that Ebola treatment unit, the protocols we followed, the equipment we were using, it was all safe and appropriate. I'm convinced that my, my contact with the disease came outside of the Ebola treatment unit with one of the patients I interacted with in the emergency department. 
Because you see, during this six or seven weeks of treating patients in the Ebola treatment unit, I was still having to take call for C-sections, for cesarean deliveries. There were only a few doctors in our hospital who were trained to do that surgery. And so if we had pregnant patients who needed a cesarean delivery, I had to be on call at nighttime to do that. And, and I was still going to the emergency department several times every day to evaluate patients that the nurses were concerned may be suspected Ebola cases. And I'm convinced that my contact came through one of those patients, one of those people in the emergency department who was very sick. In fact, while I will never know for sure, you can imagine I've thought about this a lot, trying to figure out how did this happen. And I think it was probably on July 14th, on a night when I admitted two very sick patients from our hospital into the Ebola treatment unit. And we stayed up all night long trying to save the lives of these two women. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, they both died. And I think it was during that very long night as I tried to counsel family members and tell them what was happening with their loved one. And as I tried to gain the trust of these families who were very skeptical of what we were doing in the Ebola treatment unit, I think it was through that hand-holding, through putting my hand on the daughter's shoulder, I think that's probably where I came in contact with the disease. But I'll never know for sure. But so you can imagine when I woke up on July 23rd, having been living in this very difficult situation for seven weeks, I was not naive enough to think it was impossible for me to have Ebola. I thought it was very unlikely because we were doing everything safely, but I knew it was not impossible. So I called our team leader, Dr. Lance Plyler, and I told him my symptoms, that I had a fever, my stomach was upset, and I said, I think it will be gone by lunchtime. He said, okay, call me at lunchtime and let me know how you're doing. But by lunchtime, my fever had increased to 101.4, I don't know, maybe 33 and a half degrees. Um, my I began to feel very fatigued, very tired. And so I called Dr. Lance and I told him my situation and we both knew what needed to happen. He called three of my colleagues who came to my house. They dressed up in the full personal protective equipment with two pairs of gloves and they came in and drew my blood for an Ebola test. They also tested a rapid, they checked a rapid test for malaria, the finger stick test. I had already done that twice that morning at home. I had a box of tests at home. And it was negative all three times. So they drew my blood. And you see, I was the medical director of the unit. So all of the people in the lab who were running the tests, they knew me and I knew them. And we didn't want to create a panic among our staff. So we chose to use a pseudonym on the blood sample. So instead of putting my name on it, we made up a, a Liberian sounding name. And so my name was no longer Kent Brantley, it was Tomba Snell. That first test came back negative, but we knew based on our protocol with the laboratory equipment we were using that sometimes the test is negative up during the first 72 hours of illness. So I was quarantined in my house for three more days to wait a second test. On, on Tuesday, on Monday of that week, I woke up with melana, black blood in my diarrhea, and I received a blood transfusion from our hospital blood bank. The next day, on Tuesday, I woke up vomiting blood, and this, this time one of my neighbors donated a unit of blood for me. I also developed a petechial rash started out with just little red spots, but over time it progressed until my skin was bright red from head to toe and my eyes became red and bloodshot. On Wednesday, I received a third blood transfusion. This time it was from Jiba, our 14-year-old survivor. He had kept in touch with me by telephone after his recovery. He would call me every few days to check and see how we were doing and to give us an update on himself. So when he found out I was sick, he and his family wanted to help in some way. 
It turned out we were the same blood type. And so he donated a unit of blood for me. But by Wednesday night, my illness began to progress. I became incontinent of stool. I was unable to control my own bodily functions. I was too weak to get out of bed and walk to the bathroom. So I had to allow the nurses to put an adult diaper on me. And I had to allow them to change that diaper whenever it was necessary. On Thursday afternoon, I called my colleague, Dr. John Fankhauser. We had been working together for, for nine months in Liberia. Dr. John had been the primary doctor taking care of me in my house for that first week of my illness. But on this day, Thursday, he was actually in isolation himself because he had spiked a fever. Fortunately, his fever had gone away, but the team told him, you have to stay in isolation for 72 hours until we have a negative test. So I called him on the telephone and I told him that I felt very weak and dizzy. I felt like I was going to faint. I couldn't stand up. My fever was unrelenting. It was approaching 105 degrees or 30 or 100. That's, that's 40, about 40 degrees centigrade. I had the worst headache of my life. My breathing was becoming very difficult. So Dr. John called some other team members and two of the volunteers from Samaritan's Purse came to check on me, Dr. Linda and, and a physician's assistant named Allison. And when they arrived in my house, they found me in what they described as terrible condition. They said that I was breathing 30 times per minute and my oxygen level was 87%. My heart was racing and despite large doses of acetaminophen and putting cold towels on my body, my, my fever was, was almost 105 degrees. So Dr. Linda called our team leader, Dr. Lance, and she told him that my condition was critical. So Lance and the team decided in that moment that they would give me the first dose of this experimental drug called ZMAP. At the same time, Lance began to call the rest of the team in Liberia, and he called my family, and he told them that my condition was critical, and he asked them to pray. And for the next hour, hundreds, maybe thousands of people in Liberia and around the world were praying for me, begging God to save my life. And the team began to administer the ZMAP, the experimental drug, and I had a reaction to the drug. I developed rigors uncontrollable, violent shaking and shivering of my body, which made the breathing even more difficult. They gave me a second dose of diphenhydramine or Benadryl, the antihistamine for allergic reactions. And I remember them discussing whether or not to give me the injection of steroids that was beside my bed, because they thought if this is an allergic reaction, he may die from the, from the allergy. But if this is not an allergic reaction, we give him the steroid, he might die from the disease because we just weakened his immune system with steroids. But over the next 30 minutes or 45 minutes, the shaking subsided. My temperature came down a little bit. My breathing eased a little bit. And my condition stabilized. After two or three hours, I was able to get up and walk to the bathroom, something I had not done in more than a day. And over the next 24 hours, my condition and my strength continued to improve a little bit. And Friday night, I walked out of my house and climbed on to the back of a, a small truck that they had converted into a, a makeshift ambulance. And we took the 45 minute drive to the airport where I walked onto this special top secret airplane and was flown back to America to be treated at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. In Atlanta, I received my second and third doses of ZMAP and the team there gave me incredible care. They were very compassionate they, they not only treated my disease, but they entered into my suffering and they connected with me on a, on a personal level because they recognized the trauma of the experience I was going through. 
And over a few days, about three weeks, I gradually recovered from Ebola virus disease. I am very thankful to that team in Liberia, my colleagues and friends and peers who took care of me in, in the most difficult experience of my life. Imagine what they were going through. I was the one reassuring them that the training we were given, the equipment we were using, the protocols we were following were safe. That was my job as the medical director. And then I became ill and they still put on those same suits and followed those same protocols to take care of me when I needed it. And I'm so thankful to that team at Emory University Hospital. No one in America had ever taken care of a patient with Ebola virus disease in America. But this team at Emory University Hospital had been preparing for 12 years a, a unit that they called the Serious Communicable Disease Unit. They were practiced and ready, and they said yes to take care of the first patient with Ebola in America. I'm thankful to Samaritan's Purse, the organization I worked for, because they put every effort forward to bring me home when I was sick. I'm thankful to the United States government and the people that I will never get to meet who used the resources at their disposal to do what had never been done before to take a patient who was sick with Ebola and fly them across the Atlantic Ocean and treat them in one of America's premier medical facilities. And I'm also very thankful to the hundreds and thousands of people who prayed for me in my illness. Because there were people praying not only that God would do a miracle and save my life, but they were also praying that I would have peace in the midst of that suffering and that I would have courage and faith to remain faithful to God in the face of what seemed like certain death. So that's my story. That is how I responded to a disaster in the place where I was living and working. How I became the victim of the very illness I was trying to treat. And how I survived, beating the odds and becoming the first person to be treated for Ebola in the United States of America. Unfortunately, my success story was not the end of Ebola. You see, that outbreak that started in December of 2013 was not declared officially over until January of 2016, more than two years. And the day after it was declared over, there was a new case diagnosed in Sierra Leone. It takes 42 days to declare Ebola transmission ceased. 42 days after that case in, in Sierra Leone, the World Health Organization declared that Ebola transmission in West Africa was once again complete. And only hours later, two new cases were diagnosed in Guinea, and three suspected cases were admitted to a unit. There is no simple solution to the devastating problems that face our world. And right now, Ebola is only one of many public health issues that are facing our global community. There are other problems like Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or the Zika virus, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, maternal mortality and under five mortality, not to mention war and millions of people displaced from their homes there is no solution to these problems. There will be no solution to these problems until we all, as a global community, and especially those of us in the medical profession, come back to the virtues upon which our profession was founded. We must love our neighbors as ourselves. We must remember, as physicians, that we have an obligation to the weak and the vulnerable among us. We must remember why we be became physicians in the first place. And that's my challenge to you, especially to you medical students, as you proceed down this long road of education to become a physician. I challenge you, I encourage you to consider your motivation, to remember that 
there is something sacred about the profession of medicine and the physician-patient relationship. And, and if we remember that motivation, if we remember those virtues upon which the profession of medicine is founded, if we remember the teaching of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself, then we can learn to be truly excellent physicians. Thank you very much. Many thanks for this inspirative story, Kent. Probably I forgot to tell you, but you already know that in 2014 he was selected Person of the Year of Time Magazine. Do you know what does it mean? In 2009 it was Obama. In 2015 <laughs> it was Angela Merkel. In 2012 it was Vladimir Putin. In 2014 was he. <laughs>